Welcome to Governance Training for CRCs. I'm Andrew Huffer and today I'm joined again by the fantabulous John Denton. How are you going today, John? Good day, Andrew. Great to be here. Fantastic. And again, we have the blessing of the presence of Gordon Marwick, who's Chair of the York CRC. Welcome aboard, Gordon. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks for that lovely introduction. It's good to have you back again. And just as a bit of a reminder about your role with the CRC, how long have you been involved there at York? It's a uh, relatively a new member, Andrew. I've only done two years. Um, I've come from a background of community involvement um, over a, a pretty long time, including local government and most sporting clubs in town. And I'm finding this uh, a really pleasurable experience. Fantastic. And you've got a committee of about 12 10, or so, 10 people? 10, yep. Yeah. And a pretty uh, wide variety of backgrounds, I've noticed. Have a good background. Um, we have uh, people with many talents, right down to IT technicians. Um, people involved in the York radio station with um, media experience. We have a treasurer that's highly qualified. Um, uh, yeah, we have a good mix of people and we gel very well together. And I think that shows how important it is with a, with a wide variety of people, the importance of um, maintaining confidentiality when you're working with your team. And that's, that's the focus of today's episode. So we're into episode eight of our 10 episode program. Just like to, uh, recap what we captured last episode when we talked about board performance and we talked about having the skills matrix for our board positions making sure we're really clear on the skills we need to have and then think about what are some of the ways we can go and develop those skills we also talked about um, the importance of having participation in our meetings and the way we can create an environment that people really want to be part of as, as being involved in that crc committee and we talked about the critical aspects for being a leader or a chairman of your group and what are some of the things you really need to make sure you have in place to ensure that everyone's on board with you and importantly understands where you're going with your committee. We also talked about having the uh, MSO tools and assessments that you can use and these are particularly important for, for a lot of groups who are just trying to find their way in board performance and again we'd always encourage you to look to MSO to make sure you've got some simple tools and templates that you can use to, to take you forward. So today, confidentiality, what can we talk about? We're going to talk about the actual role of confidentiality within the CRC. Why do you need it? And what are some of the issues it's going to impact on? We'll talk about the actual services in your CRC and how they relate to confidentiality that you may not have considered before. And importantly, we want to talk about some of the practical policies and procedures that you need to have in place to make sure that you're operating, operating a very transparent system, but also one that's quite robust, especially when it comes to confidentiality. John, I want to talk to you, get you to take us through what's the role of confidentiality within a CRC and, and how it can help our CRCs in understanding what it's all about and what's all the fuss anyway. Confidentiality is there to protect all the stakeholders in the CRC, clients, staff, community board members, and also the integrity of the organisation to make sure that the organisation has a good name in the community and does the right thing by everybody. So it's about, say, meeting the integrity of the organisation. And if we look at those stakeholders and talk about some of the confidentiality issues with each of those stakeholders, I think it'll become very clear what the confidentiality is all about. So if we look at clients, um, obviously clients of the CRC are going to be giving up personal information like names and addresses and so on. And that's, again, you, some of these communities that the CRCs serve are quite small, close-knit communities. So maintaining confidentiality can be quite tricky. Um, Gordon, what are some of the issues that can come up? I guess you look at the banking situation, um, where you have people come in, pay by credit card. Um, we need to make sure that they are protected. Uh, the staff certainly need to know that when they sign that confidentiality clause when they're employed, they need to make sure they adhere to that clause. Um, so the staff have got to play a pretty major role in, in the confidentiality line, um, but we need to protect our clients and whatever happens between the client and the staff must stay and not get out of that confined environment. Yeah, so it's not just names and addresses and 
credit card information, but there's relationships to be protected as well. I know this is something that uh, you talked about. Like I know a lot of CRCs that are providing services to local businesses, and and if perhaps you you through some of those services you provide, you start to, I guess, be find out about some challenges that they're having within the business, perhaps, or or they may be developing new relationships that's going to provide an expansion of the business. It's it's always important for us to make sure that 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 information doesn't go anywhere apart from within the client because um and again John you mentioned earlier on in a small town things things happen pretty quickly when it comes to talk around town the the fact is that word gets around very quickly so you know loose lips sink ships so just be careful what uh, you're communicating to people and obviously the financial situation as well and it can be something as simple as you know a client's credit card bounces a couple of times and now people start to read things into that and then again the rumours start to spread and words get around so when those sort of things happen the staff need to know that it's just between them and the client and nobody else. Talking of staff let's have a look at staff confidentiality and again it may be things that just isn't that obvious when uh, staff are on leave or taking leave and there's again information that they may not want to get out. Yeah and to me it can be something as simple as the type of leave they've applied for or when they're away and and simple things like telling people when others are away could lead, could have some serious consequences if they come home and the house is empty those kind of things so it's a thing I think it's the simple things that may come up in conversation we don't actually pay attention to that inadvertently could come out through us having access to information that others don't. Yeah, so it's not that people are trying to be malicious necessarily or uh, it's just that they say things around the coffee machine or in the coffee shop and then people overhear and things get spread and then the rumour goes around town. If people don't turn up for work uh, for a few days and they've got health issues and things like that, it's not anybody's business um, and that is something that, that obviously the individual wouldn't want to get around either. So. Again, don't go uh, saying things around the, the coffee machine or in the coffee shop that's going to spread rumours or start uh, anything, anything that the staff member wouldn't want to be heard. Absolutely. Think about your own situation and what you wouldn't want people to be saying about you. And again, something as simple as performance. So you're talking about reliability. If people are, are performing in a particular way in their role in the CRC, it's, it's between the manager or the coordinator of the CRC and the individual, it's got nothing to do with the, the world outside. So you don't want a reputation getting around that somebody's slack or unreliable, exactly as Andrew was saying. Absolutely, and I think this can be an area of real damage both for potentially for staff members and for the CRC itself. If, if these sort of conversations get out into the, um, the public arena, then the, the perception of the CRC and its board is really going to be seriously damaged and, and I think the re repercussions for that could be quite serious, especially in, in a number of realms but also in the op opportunity to bring new people back into the committee in those type of areas. I think you're really going to be fighting an uphill struggle to do that. Um, Gordon, I'd be interested in your comments on that in terms of that, the importance of having that staff information, performance information kept locked down quite tightly. Very important. Andrew, um, we rely on our coordinator to to brief us at our meetings on if there are an issue with staff uh, in performance and of course through the confidentiality file that is kept within our board. If we have an issue with the coordinator it's usually something that myself or our executive committee would look at to deal with that issue um, and take it back to the board if if there is a, a, a need to do that. But it's really confidential. You have to make sure you can't stress it enough to keep these issues in-house. They cannot get out. So board confidentiality. Again, the board are privy to a lot of information on impending decisions and what's happening in the community, uh, projects that are coming up and all kind of things like that and it's absolutely 
critical that the board keep that information confidential and that it doesn't get out, or that they're seen to be favouring people by providing information. Andrew or Gordon, have you got anything to say? I think it speaks for itself, John. Um, you have to respect other people's um, situations and the board have to re accept that role that they sign into when they sign the confidentiality agreement and as laid out in your policies and procedure manual there is a format to follow and, and they expect you to follow that. And of course relationship with staff, so what's happening between the board members and staff in terms of their performance and employment and so on needs to be kept confidential and financial issues, financial issues to do with the, the CRC or even with board members. Um, you know, again, being on the board, you get privy to information which you wouldn't otherwise, and it's absolutely critical that it just stays in the room or stays with the board. And just stepping back a moment to that relationships with staff, like I was recently at a, a local government meeting here in Perth, and it's a special meeting, and, and you could see during that meeting that there was some discord between the, the staff and the um, and council members and become quite clear. And to me, I think they, they were starting to cross the line a bit in terms of um, not presenting a united front, not saying, yep, we're here together, working together, that there's actually some direct criticism in, in a public meeting of between, um, between councillors and staff. And I was thinking, well, that's starting to really cross the line and actually, for me as a ratepayer, it sowed some seeds of discontent for me, thinking, well, what is going on with these guys? So to me, that, that's all, almost, it's not quite a full-on confidenti confidentiality issue, but I think it's part of that to make sure that everyone is really on the same page and, and present that com constantly throughout as a group. And that's where the integrity of the organisation starts to suffer. John, also on the relationship with the staff, I think it's absolutely imperative that the coordinator and the chairperson have a relationship, a working relationship which is strong, um, trusting, because those two people that are head of their respective, one head of the board, one head of the staff, must have a clear understanding of what they're doing and, and how, the, how the, the business is operating. And there should be no holes barred, there should be nothing kept from each other, but it has to be strictly on a working relationship and I've, I've found in my time in local government, when I was Shire President, I had to have a very close link with the CEO of the council. Um, we used to talk almost daily. Uh, it's just so important that we understand each of our functions and that we can work together and that benefits the whole organisation right through the program. And I think you, you brought out a really important point there, Gordon, in terms of um, it's a professional relationship. So you don't have to be a social best buddy with this person. It's strictly business, but clear, strong, trusting relationship. And that seemed to be the, the key word that you've mentioned to me a few times. It's all about trust, it's open, and everything's on the table. Absolutely. Wow, trust, that's a big word. It that's is. a big word. We'll be going on to look at some of the areas where um, confidential information can leak out of the organisation and some of the ways to protect that, but first, um, Andrew, if you'd like to talk about confidentiality and some of the CRC services. Yeah, uh, thanks, John. I think from a, from a practical perspective, there's a couple of simple ones we, we may not consider but are really up there. You know, the, the video conferencing facilities, which is a great facility that the CRC provides, so we need to make sure that our clients um, trust us as a CRC to provide those confidentially, that we know that when we're having, especially for a business or even a, a government organisation, that we we know that what's said in the room is between us and the person at the other end of the, the camera there and it's not going to go anywhere between those beyond those four walls. So they need to be really confident when they book a video conference, that's, that's what all that's going to happen. Another service that CRCs provide exceptionally well and has really made a difference for a lot of people in, in the more remote communities of the rural inReach program where people are going into the CRCs and using the video conferencing facilities for counselling services and obviously that needs to be something that's 100% confidential and that all, all staff need to know is they've got a booking and, and that's it and that's not going any further ever because it's such an important service that just should never be compromised. Um, 
and, and we know a lot of CRCs have that have that role as an agency, whether it be through Centrelink and Medicare. And then for people, you know, we, we've all grown up in, in small country towns, so we know that for a lot of rural people, having to go to Centrelink in the first place is 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 not easy. So I think we need to be quite clear that that's again a no-go zone. And Medicare to deal with a health issue, same sort of thing. So these are. I guess they're, they're simple, but I think we just need to be really mindful of our role and making sure that that's all crystal clear that these are these are services we provide, but uh, as far as the client's use of them, nobody else really needs to know. And, and John, you've mentioned in previous episodes about the importance of the, the new privacy laws that we need to be across those as a board and, and a CRC, making sure we're quite clear on, on what our responsibilities are. The government's doing the right thing I believe, in bringing in these privacy laws and tightening up how information is kept and what, it, what you do with information after you've finished um, using it for the purpose for which it was given. And with the advent of social media, nothing's private anymore, everything gets around very, very quickly. So again, a lot of the laws are there to protect things getting out to the, the wider community. So it's a question of making sure that you're across those laws and regulations and putting your compliance. It comes down to policies and procedures. Andrew? Yeah, and I guess that, that's a critical thing where we really want to focus on today is making sure that as a CRC you've got a, a very systematic approach to maintaining confidentiality and protecting both your, your clients but also protecting the CRC's reputation that it, and it is that it becomes one of trust that can be maintained within your community and, and with staff and also with the people that use it. So, John, I'm really interested to hear now your views on um, some of the policies and procedures that CRCs should have in place to make sure that that trust is maintained at all times. The, the important thing about having policies and procedures is making it very, very clear to staff exactly what information is available, what can be communicated to whom and under what circumstances. And that should all be documented for all areas in the policies and procedures for all areas of the, the CRC. So one of the questions to ask of course is information access. Who has permission to what information? And I always recommend a bit like the skills matrix, develop a matrix of uh, permissions. So who are the people, what's the permission and access to information that they need? And this covers all sorts of areas. I mean one would be, for example, banking and accessing the, the bank accounts, uh, which is a key one. I know of a number of situations where fraud has occurred because of people getting away or begin, being given too much access to bank accounts. So Gordon, how does that operate in York? What, who has access to the bank information? In our situation, John, we have three people who have access. Obviously the coordinator who puts the accounts together and makes the payments, has access. Uh, myself as the chairperson and the treasurer has access to the bank for authorisation and we need any two to authorise payment at any one time. Um, but usually the coordinator is one and it's either myself or the treasurer is a second signatory to the cheques or the payments. Okay, so that's you've always got that second set of eyes looking at yes. what's being paid out and what transactions are happening, which is great. And of course, a lot of banking these days is done via the internet, and internet is another area of security concerns where you need to protect information. For example, if the CRC is providing a, a Wi-Fi service or a, an internet service, then is that on the same network as the CRC's internal admin network? Because, again, it makes it easier for, for hackers if the, everything's on the one network. So um, some of my clients, they provide a, a network or access to the internet for guests and people visiting, but it's a totally separate and uh, firewalled connection to their own internal admin systems. So there's lots of areas where you need to think about access to information and also backup of that information as well. Gordon, how often do you do backups at York, for every, example? Every night. Every night. We have an external hard drive. Um, everything is backed up onto it. It's taken home and uh, brought back again the next day. 
Um, can't stress highly enough the importance of backup. We also have a PC internet um, service that does backups for us as well and uh, also has access to our computers whenever we may have a downtime or a problem with them. Uh, they're there at a, at a phone call away. But um, very, very important, John, to have your backups and do it regularly. Absolutely, Gordon, and that's true in business as well. And uh, it scares me sometimes when I see how infrequently people do their backups. And the other thing as well with that is that doing backups is one thing, but actually test the backups, test that you can do the restores uh, of the data. You know, I've known situations where people have, have done those backups, Gordon, but when it came to the crunch and they had to restore the data, they couldn't actually get the data back. So you need to test the whole procedure, backing it up, storing it, and then restoring it as well. So let's move on and look at the misuse of information. Again, as we talked about with board members and board members' responsibility, it has to be made very clear that information that they're privy to isn't used for their own uh, personal gain. And this is where confidentiality agreements and a good uh, policy comes into, into play. Quite often, CRCs will provide some services to the community or to businesses in the community that involve, again, a lot of sensitive information for clients. Um, Andrew, I think you talked about bookkeeping being one of those. Yeah, I know of some CRCs that are either brokering that or looking at providing that directly. And so it's obviously there's going to be some pretty, um, some pretty sensitive information come up through that. And so it's, it's critical that there's uh, policies and procedures in place to, to manage that information so it's, it's not used in, in an unethical way. And you can see the example there that you know there is that potential that perhaps a, a staff member or board member could become aware of the financial situation of a client and, and use that for their own gain. And, and, if, and if that happens, then it's pretty much game over for the, the CRC, I think, in terms of their, their reputation if something like that got out. I guess um, people could be working at the CRC and be privy to some of that information, and although they may not be in a position to use that information for their own gain, they may have a friend or a relative who could. And again, there may be some temptation there to just let some of that information slip out. So that's a, an absolute no-no. And hence, as Gordon mentioned before, you need confidentiality agreements in place and signed by, by all the staff members and board members, of course. John, also, at, uh, we've been outsourcing a couple of staff members recently to the local council. And of course, that is covered by their confidentiality when they start working with the council and they've got their own that are with the CRC so we've got two lots of confidentiality and uh, you just can't stress enough how important it is that it stays in house that's information. And the, the other thing which we haven't covered yet of course is social media. Uh, social media is a big outlet for confidential information and so there needs to be some good policies in place and enforce policies about how people use social media. Uh, most CRCs I know have Facebook pages, for instance. So what's the policy as far as who can put information on there and what information they, they put on there? You know, there's a danger that some of the stuff that gets posted is a individual's personal opinion um, and not the CRCs or the boards. So any thoughts on how you can control some of that? Well, it's a dangerous area, John. It sure it's is. It's a very dangerous area with Twitter and Facebook and the likes. Um, we do have our own York CRC Facebook page, which is managed by our, our staff in-house. We've got the area covered in our policy and procedure manual regarding what they can put on that if they violate the code. But um, look, I just can't stress enough, it, it's scary. Um, this whole avenue of flowing information that is actually uncontrollable at times and it needs to be stopped before it starts. Yeah, so d does your policy allow for um, more than one administrator of the Facebook page so that if somebody puts something up, um, it can be taken down quickly and, and rectified? Yes, absolutely. That's something, again, uh, is easy to overlook. You set up a Facebook page, you make the coordinator or some individual responsible for it and doing the posts, and then something gets put up there which you don't want or the board don't want and no one else can get access to take it down. So 
again, you've got to have a policy and you've got to have procedures in place to make sure that you can safeguard what, what gets posted. Uh, we've all heard stories, I'm sure, about um, damage that gets done through social media. Absolutely. You just you look at what happens around like a lot of the major sporting codes and, and that's where they get hit a lot with people just doing a, I guess, an off-the-cuff type thing, a quick tweet and bang, there's you know, the reputation of the team or the club is in, in, in tatters, literally. And we've had, you see an example pretty much from most sporting codes of somebody being sacked each week for saying something inappropriate on social media, which uh, to me, it's, it's, like you said earlier, it's prevention. It's completely unnecessary. So why, is, why spread your thoughts when they should be discussed in-house, firstly? And but of for course, me, it can affect cafes as well, Andrew. Yeah, and <laughs> <laughs> that's right. With our staff, we make it really clear that it, our reputation is paramount in our community and we don't want any threat to that at all. So we, we want people to participate in an, in an online forum, but we want, make, want to make sure it's done, I guess, appropriately. So it encourages people to get involved and, and they don't think they're coming into an atmosphere where there's going to be all these sorts of accusations or, or, or their reputation is going to be harmed or they're going to be harmed. So to me, it's making it really clear that social media has its, certainly has its place and it has a lot of benefits but it's how it's used, it's, it's most important. Yep, so there's some dangers there. There's some great benefits to be had from social media marketing and social media, particularly with community engagement and things like that, but you do need to, to protect the organisation as well. John, I think you also need to include text messages in that as well. You can write a text message and it can mean a lot of things to a lot of different people. It's the way it's written. One simple line in a text message can, can be taken out of context and you know, once again, that's another scary outlet that we've got to deal with. Absolutely right. The other policy as well, which you need to think about, is what happens, how do you manage the information, confidential information, when you've got it? How do you ensure that confidential information is destroyed when it's no longer needed? And there's many ways to potentially destroy confidential information. If you've got paper hard copies, how, what's your policy and how, what's your procedure? You know, I've seen people throw confidential stuff into waste bins. Now it's accessible to anyone else in the office who wants to go through the bin, or it gets put in the rubbish. I mean, where does it end? For, for us, John, um, we recently shifted house and we had, so we've had about 10 years of tax records and all sorts of records that we've had there sitting around, or sitting around, securely stored. <laughs> um, but when it was time to shift, we didn't need all that information, so we just basically got a commercial shredder in so they could ensure confidentiality of the whole procedure right from start to go, from go to woe. So they'd come on site, they bought all the material they needed and actually destroyed the information on site in front of us. So we could be quite comfortable that that work had been done and it didn't waste our time of putting stuff through a shredder, which would have taken a long time. And for a relatively small investment, it was done in a secure way. Uh, to, to ISO standards actually. So for us, we had that peace of mind knowing those records, our records weren't going to go any further. So for a CRC, knowing your client records aren't going to go any further, having that commercial options worth thinking about too. I love shredders. I bought a shredder some years ago, but not just for our personal stuff, but because I deal with a lot of confidential client information in my uh, business. And once I don't no longer need that information, I make sure it goes through the shredder. But then with electronic information as well, this is another one. How do you destroy electronic information? Because you may have confidential information on disk drives, uh, it may be on backup tapes. So again, how do you know it's actually gone? Any thoughts, Gordon? Or? Well, John, you're the expert on tech, eh? so I'm wanting to hear the results, how do you, how you do it? <laughs> well, it, it's interesting because people think when something's deleted from a disk on a computer that it's actually deleted. And that's not the case. This is why you see on these crime shows and things where police are able to get into people's or the forensics people are able to get into computers and get a whole lot of data off there which people thought they had deleted. Because when you delete data on a computer, you're only actually deleting an index pointer to that data. The data is still sitting there. So you can get tools, cleaning tools, which will remove the real data. Well, it does stay on the hard drive forever until the hard drive is destroyed, I guess. Correct. Or it's wiped. That's what I say. You yeah. can get software which will wipe the data. So you need to keep the data secure when you've got it. You need to make sure that it's obviously updated if, you, if it's for ongoing use. 
an archive properly and then destroyed properly when, when it's no longer needed. Before we move on and talk about resources and systems, the other thing that, again, a lot of organisations, businesses and not-for-profits not for forget is when someone leaves the organisation, just like you have an induction process when they come in, do you have an exit strategy and an exit policy and procedure when they leave so that you remove their passwords and their access to information, get keys back off them and things like that. Gordon, any? Yes, we just believe that we need to have a debriefing session um, with any staff member that leaves. We need to sit down with them, um, go through a debrief and find out why they left. Um, what have we done wrong? Can we do things better um, for when we when we re-employ the next staff member? So I just think a debriefing is a very important tool as well to have. And there's nothing worse than a disgruntled uh, staff member if they're mm. leaving under not such good circumstances they can do a heck of a lot of damage uh, depending on their access to to things as well so you need to minimize any risk there so Andrew if you'd like to take us through some of the online resources that are available to CRCs in this area thanks John and as we've said before that the MSO is a, is a great resource for the, for any CRC especially if you if you're really just coming into this area and you're thinking oh, where do I start then to me MSO is a, is a great opportunity to do that so there's some templates there about uh, how to store them, what some of the policies and procedures should be around those. There's um, who should have access to what information. So there's, again, another way you can just simply download that from MSO and adapt it to your CRC. And there's also the confidentiality template. So there's a couple of quick things you can simply grab and adapt to your CRC and make sure they work for you without you having to do all the work all over again. Some other quick tips just before we finish up on this point. Gordon, a quick tip from you in terms of resources and systems. I think, Andrew, one of our biggest strengths in this family that we're in, that CRC family, is, the, is your next door neighbour's CRC. And the issues that we may have, they're probably having the same issues. So pick up the phone, ring your next door neighbour's CRC, share your information, and you'll usually get the answer. You also mentioned earlier about the use of keys in, in, within your CRC. A quick tip for that? Yep, filing cabinet, confidential, confidential files, one person, one key. And John, a quick tip from you on passwords. Yes, Andrew, make sure that um, it isn't just one password, one person. So what you don't want is for the board or the CRC to be locked out of information. So if only one person knows the password to critical information and that person gets knocked over by a bus or leaves in a you know, disgruntled manner, then I've actually seen this happen where you know, board members and uh, administrators get locked out of information. So again, control the passwords, who has access and make sure that it's maintained. I also want to just briefly recap, I guess, on what you talked about earlier, John and Gordon, in terms of the, the resources and systems in place, in terms of protection of electronic records. You talked there about having that, that really thorough approach to make sure things have gone out of the system. Um, to make sure you've actually properly destroyed the hard copy of, of your records that were required and that sensitive information is stored properly and, and can make sure that it's only accessed by the right people but it's also uh, protected properly. And, and Gordon, you mentioned about having things stored off site in a backup perspective rather than having a backup stored on site where it's pretty much useless in a lot of the cases if say if there's a disaster like a fire or, or flood or break in. So that's been another big episode. So let's do a quick recap of what we've covered to help make sure that you maintain a really confidential and properly managed CRC. So we talked off talking about the role of confidentiality, what's the fuss about it, why do we need it. We also talked about some of the critical services that you offer as a CRC where this is going to impact on. And we talked about, importantly, the practical policies and procedures that you're going to need to have in place to make sure that you maintain confidentiality in the operations of your CRC and maintain the integrity of your information both for your clients, for staff and also making sure that the reputation of your CRC is intact at all times. Again, in between episodes, we'd like you to go back and pick up the workbook, go back through the episode and think about the three things you'd like to apply in regard to this episode. Remember, MSO has heaps of fantastic resources for CRCs. Here are just a few that we recommend that are most relevant to today's episode. Coming up next, we're going to be talking about ethics. So it's going to be a strong link to what we talked about in confidentiality. So please
please make sure you, you set aside the time to, to, to join us then. John, thanks again for being on board and giving us some really good practical insights, especially from the, the electronic world of uh, confidentiality. Always my pleasure, Andrew. And, and Gordon, thanks again for joining us from, from the York CRC and giving us the real practical side of how you manage confidentiality and making sure the reputation of your CRC is protected. Thanks, Andrew, and thanks, John. And I'll just say it's nice to be part of the CRC family. Thank you. And thanks, folks, for joining us. We look forward to having you on board with our next episode when we focus on ethics. We'll see you there. Bye now. Mm -hmm.